This is a Wool Observatory podcast. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Star Stuff. Um, I am not Cody Half Moon, the regular hostess. I'm Kevin Schindler, the historian and public information officer at Lowell Observatory. And I'm pleased to participate in this series. We talk all things astronomy and space. Um, joining me today is Eric Edelman, the planetarium director with Embry Riddle Aeronautical uh, University in Prescott. Um, welcome, Eric, and thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, it was good to come up to Flagstaff. You guys have a beautiful trees around here. Oh, it's it's a great setting, and this yeah. is the time of year to be here, especially um, the temperature because monsoons have started, and it's uh, just really nice. It's, it's not it's not overly hot, and it and compared to the furnace of Phoenix, um, it's a nice escape. Is it even possible to get here in the winter? Um, oh yeah. Yeah, winter is a great time to come. Uh, um, in fact, some of the some great telescope viewing is in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, you have to get up our hill, Mars Hill yeah. Road. Um, the the location where we're sitting is nicknamed Mars Road, Mars Hill Road, because um, back when the observatory was founded, the locals talked about this guy named Percival Lowell who studied Mars. So they called this Mars Hill that we're on, and you get up here by taking Mars Hill Road. So every visitor to Lowell Observatory, unless they've dropped in by helicopter, um, they come up Mars Hill Road. So thanks for doing that today. Oh, of course. So we got a lot of stuff to talk about um, because Embry-Riddle um, and Lowell Observatory were starting a partnership, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, and you are the planetarium director. Um, so let's, let's first talk about your background a little bit, um, who you are, where you came from, schooling. And, sure. then we'll, and then we'll figure out how you ended up here. Yeah, uh, a, a long winding road, just like uh, Mars Hill. The Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, originally when uh, I was going to school, I didn't like science. Where'd you I, go to school? Um, uh, so I went uh, in high school. I was over in the California, uh, Northern California region. Um, and uh, I just, I, would, I was able to do it. I just didn't uh, appreciate, uh, I guess, the story behind it. I didn't, I didn't hear about the story behind it as much as just doing the equations, you know, going through it by rote. Uh, and then I, when I got to college, I went over to Wesleyan University over in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, when I got the opportunity to uh, read A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. Yes. I don't know how many stories you've heard where that is the tipping point, but it certainly was mine where all of a sudden I got that understanding that, wow, this is... Uh, the numbers display a intricate, beautiful complexity. Like that, they're, they're not just numbers; they're the universe. Uh, and uh, that's that story was what inspired me to get my degrees in astronomy, uh, and also to get those degrees with a bit of a vendetta in my heart of, mm. hey, I didn't find this inspiration myself when I was growing up, and how can I share that inspiration with others now that I've found it? Uh, and so I went into the educational outreach side of things. I was doing uh, live streams uh, for a, a, an astronomy company called SLU for a while. Then I went into the museum industry and well, hey, uh, over in Prescott, Arizona, Embry-Riddle, they started to build a planetarium and they needed someone to run it. And so I uh, put my hat in the ring as it were, and hey, they decided to uh, let me do it. And I've been here ever since 2017 start. Well, your story is really great and ties in with Lowell so well, because one of our goals here you know, we've been around since 1894, 18 years before Arizona was even a state, yeah. Lowell was established. And we do science, we do education, but we really think of ourselves as science communicators, mm -hmm. communicating our science, communicating the excitement of the night sky. And as humans, we're explorers yeah. and we like to go outside and, and look around. And being inspired um, and inspiring kids is a key part of what we do. Um, because, you know, the world is a fast moving place yeah. and there's a lot of things going on in the world. And I think to, to be able to step back a little bit and appreciate what's around you. Um, you know, you were talking about looking at a lot of numbers, but when you just look up at the sky, mm -hmm. it's it's that that feeling of awe and wonder. Yeah. Um, and that's really what we try to be about here. I um, mean, what you're doing is um, really focusing on the awe and wonder, mm -hmm. of course, to do astronomy. Um, there, there's some numbers involved. Certainly, um, it's you know heavy physics and mathematics oh, and yeah. such, but but it comes down to that core human passion of of awe and wonder mm -hmm. and looking up, and so it, this is such a perfect match 
um, to have you here and partnering with us yeah. um, at the observatory. Um, and our, our founder, Percival Lowell, pointed that out about the need for imagination mm -hmm. and wonder mm -hmm. and and um, inspiring future generations. He said, essentially, what's the point of doing science unless mm -hmm. you share it with people? The storytelling is so pivotal and being able to tell a story to people from different walks of life in ways that finds their own unique connection. And related to that, I'm wondering what brought you into uh, this kind of outreach, this kind of inspiration? Well, my background, I, I was originally in paleontology um, when I was seven years old in Ohio. I was out picking blackberries, found this rock that had all these little shell things in it. Yeah. And I picked it up and I found another piece. And the two things fit together. That was so cool. And I took it home. My dad shellacked it. And I learned later that these were marine organisms, fossils of brachiopods. And I was in love with fossils and paleontology. So I went to school for geology. I spent early part of my career looking down. But then I moved to Flagstaff. Mm. I've got a job here at Lowell. Mm -hmm. And I've been looking up ever since. Oh, Lowell will do that. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's that, that thing of it's it's science. It's the education. It's, it's the excitement. The awe and wonder of it all. So, oh, yeah. whether to me, whether it's fossils or galaxies, mm -hmm. it's it's that discovery, the wonder um, that makes it so neat. And you know, it's been it's a, a fun place to be here um, because there's so much. We've had millions of people come through our doors. Wow! And before COVID, we were getting a hundred thousand visitors, oh. and that's going to be going up as yeah. we open our new astronomy discovery center oh, yeah. um, next year. And that's where this partnership really continues to build. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll talk about that, but you know, you mentioned you're with Embry-Riddle. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about Embry-Riddle a little bit because the name is pretty well known yeah. um, as a, as a um, bed for, for um, future aeronautical, astronautical pursuits. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about Embry-Riddle because there's not just the campus in Prescott. Oh, yeah. So there's there's a couple of Embry-Riddles here, there, and everywhere. Uh, that There's a Daytona Beach, Florida mm -hmm. campus. There is a Prescott, Arizona campus. And then there's uh, sort of the worldwide balloon, which, which has a few different um, satellite campuses across the world. Uh, so a lot of it was what you mentioned, uh, going into aeronautics. And uh, we have uh, have have some astronauts under our belt. Like I remember, I believe, uh, for uh, your iHeart Pluto Fest, you brought in Nicole Stott. Yes. We were so excited because, hey, Nicole Stott, uh, alumni right. there. Yeah. So uh, just a small world. Uh, but yes, when it comes to exploring the sky and going higher and higher into the sky, uh, Embry-Riddle can be a very big part of that. Uh, but they also have a growing astronomy program, which the planetarium has been uh, becoming more and more a part of as well. They're getting uh, more telescopes onto the Prescott campus, which is exciting. Uh, so we have different domes, ones that close, ones that open. Yeah. Uh, so, and it seems like with uh, your uh, new building that's going to be coming into play in 2024, that uh, you're going to get a lot of uh, new domes as well, potentially. Yeah, we're, well, you know, we have just a couple of years ago as kind of this, the first phase of our expansion, because mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years before COVID, we were clearly growing. We didn't have enough parking spaces, not enough restrooms. Mm -hmm. um, at nighttime, there's long lines um, at, at our old telescopes, uh, like our 130-year-old 100, 24-inch refractor. And so phase one was to build a new telescope observing plaza. Um, it's called the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. Uh -huh. The whole building rolls back on tracks, and you have six telescopes. It's oh, an wow. instant star party. <laughs> uh, you know, roll the building back, they're set. You just point them to whatever you want to look at. So that was phase one that allowed us to spread people out mm -hmm. as well as to give them, you know, a, a state-of-the-art experience looking through these amazing telescopes. Phase two is, is uh, well, that's the appetizer. Phase two is the main course. Yeah. It's this 40,000 square foot um, new astronomy discovery center opens mm -hmm. in the fall of 2024 and, you know, three stories, one of my favorite features on the top story, part of it is a, a auditorium, as it were, 160, 180 seats. Um, and we're calling it a planetarium. Yeah. But it's an open sky planetarium. Instead of looking at projections on the ceiling, Flagstaff is the world's first international dark sky city. Mm -hmm. We've got dark skies. Let's celebrate them. We're going to look at the real thing. There's no real ceiling. The seats are tilted back, like in a planetarium, like yeah. what you guys have. And they're heated because it gets darn chilly yeah. at night sometimes. And we're going to look at the real thing. 
So I think to me, it's going to be great. It's a, it's a great compliment, I think, to each other oh, yeah. because the experience of looking through a traditional planetarium, um, an outdoor planetarium like this, looking through telescopes there, telescopes here, sharing some of the research going on between yeah. our places. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a really, a really great time, I think. Oh, yeah. Like, I am just excited to see it all in action. And I got to say that the term open air planetarium is fascinating to me. And it, it brings to mind the question of what exactly is a planetarium? Yeah. You know? um, it, and I think there's a lot of ways to explore that. And I'm wondering if you uh, know about the thought process that was involved in this being called an open air planetarium. Like, what does that mean to Lowell? Well, you know, a traditional planetarium, as we think about it, and this is a question we get all the time yeah. um, from visitors, where's the planetarium? Because if you're not in the field, planetarium, observatory, what's, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. You know, observatory is, that's confusing also because Lowell Observatory is the entire entity, mm -hmm. the institution. Um, but an observatory is also an individual building that houses the telescope or telescopes. So we have several observatories, individual observatories here, whereas a planetarium is a traditionally closed um, on the ceiling, generally, sometimes on the wall, you project images of the sky um, and it's kind of simulated being outside. But, it, you know, in 1958, um, we were building a new telescope here, brought one from Ohio mm -hmm. as our next generation big telescope. And we wanted to put it outside of Flagstaff because even though Flagstaff had dark skies, um, it was starting to grow. And so our, our team found a place 20 miles outside of town um, or so, but there were some searchlights. And so one of our astronomers used to be mayor of Flagstaff, which is handy, and he talked to some of his friends at City Hall, and they wrote an ordinance that it wasn't trying to get rid of the artificial light, but limit when it's used. You know, do you need do you need bright lights at two o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. if the business is closed? Um, and it's, it wasn't getting rid of safety lights or anything like that. It's just redoing how they're used. Mm -hmm. And and they wrote this ordinance, and that was the world's first outdoor lighting ordinance anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so. There's this long tradition of dark sky protection in Flagstaff. And so when we came with this idea of building this new visitor center came up, certainly a traditional planetarium was, was discussed. But, the, but our leader said, we've got the world's first dark sky city. We're still one of the leaders in that. Why not use this as, you know, focus on that mm -hmm. um, and use the dark skies as part of our show? Now, of course, you know, we have bad weather sometimes, it'll snow, but we also have other theaters. Mm -hmm. And so even if the weather is not good, it's just like viewing through telescopes. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it's cloudy or raining, you can't view, but there's a lot of other things you can do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so it, it came about pretty nicely. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating to me. And, and I'm trying to just sort of think in my mind, what is it that separates like a planetarium from looking up at the night sky in this sense? And to me, it seems like the seats, that in this sense, the open air planetarium is those seats that allow a storyteller to bring a community yes, together. Yes, right. Yeah. And there's, it's going to feel a lot like a traditional planetarium, except, wow, that's the sky yeah, up yeah. there. And, and we're going to have state-of-the-art AV equipment mm -hmm. to supplement that. So, you know, we can have laser pointers pointing out things up there, mm -hmm. but also have, for instance, close-up images of a nebula or galaxy and talk about you know, a structure or how it, you know, how it lives or something mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. it's, there's a lot of, a lot of thought going into this. Oh yeah. Um, so it's, uh, you know, we're, I think we're both doing the same thing and trying to ex excite people, mm -hmm. um, about space. In your case, um, the planetarium, how did that, um, originate? Was that for teaching or for the community or some combination of both? Oh yeah. Take your pick. It, it, it's yeah. all of it. Uh, so there, there were a lot of dreams that manifested themselves in this planetarium in uh, that it was the first one uh, coming to Northern Arizona. And that meant that there were so many places that it what could mean, expand. What do you mean the first one? Uh, the, the first planetarium north of Phoenix here in the state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and so uh, that meant that we were going to be um, exposing audiences who maybe had never been to a planetarium mm -hmm. before. And so one big part of it was like you mentioned that community connection. And so 
Um, the chancellor at the time, uh, Dr. Frank Ayers, he really wanted to see more of a connection between Embry-Riddle Prescott and the community that surrounded it. And he thought this bridge could be, hey, bringing people onto the campus for planetarium programming. Yep. And one of the um, strategies, this, there were a lot of strategies involved, but uh, one that was related to that was making sure that the planetarium was not just space, but was able to uh, do a lot of data visualization for different STEM topics. Mm -hmm. And so as opposed to uh, that star ball in the center of the theater that a lot of people right. are used to, the optomechanical projector, uh, Embry-Riddle went digital. And so that meant that with accompanying so software, we can go into showing IMAX films about engineering. We can go into partnering with professors on campus to say, how can we uh, put your stuff on the dome? We can uh, look at some of the NOAA data sets for science on a sphere that uh, some museums have that uh, sphere that they project onto. We just put it digitally yeah. onto the planetarium. So it, it um, widens the STEM opportunities, uh, makes it more flexible for the public and to be introduced to the Embry-Riddle culture, uh, but also uh, to yet yeah, uh, sort of provide a platform for researchers and, and different mm -hmm. things like that. So uh, uh, being a resource for campus and for the students, mm -hmm. uh, helping to um, bring inspiration of astronomy and more to the local K through 12 schools, uh, and of course, that public connection. So. so you guys came up with this great plan, connecting the community. Mm -hmm. And so much of, again, both of our organizations, yeah. so much of it is community. Oh, yeah. You know, for us, it's Flagstaff community, the science community, education, very similar. So you came up with this idea, but of course, then you have to find funding. Mm -hmm. And you were able to find that. And um, let's talk about the leads for a minute. Oh, sure. Yeah. Just tell me about how, how this all came about and who they are. And so uh, the planetarium is known as the Jim and Linda Lee Planetarium mm -hmm. for a very good reason that uh, the Lees, one of their passions is to um, to emphasize the vibrancy that is there in Prescott, Arizona and Yavapai County of uh, different uh, places that people can go and enjoy space, can en enjoy uh, beautiful programming. Uh, so they were a great supporter from the ground on uh, making this planetarium a reality. And when, when did this, when did you break ground? Uh, so breaking ground, well, the, the, the ribbon cutting ceremony was in 2017. Mm -hmm. As for the official groundbreaking, that was actually before yeah. I, I yeah. came on there. But uh, yeah, there was a little bit of time of construction of the planetarium itself and a new um, STEM education center where there mm -hmm. were upgraded labs for the students and things like that. So there was a whole big building uh, that they made uh, that was completed in 2017. So, so, so how is how is it typically used? What's the typical day with the planetarium? Oh, uh, there's no typical yeah. <laughs> day with a planetarium. What are you talking about? Uh, yeah, so it is. Um, it's why I personally love the job is that there's never a boring moment. That you're always um, there's always a new request that is as interesting and intriguing. Uh, we recently released our fall schedule where we're going all across the board. There's a weekend that we'll be going under the sea to talk about coral reefs and and talk about uh, oceans and sustainability. Uh, there's going to be a, a week with, which is classic where we're going to be talking about, hey, what constellations are up here? Just the standard Star mm -hmm. Talk show. Uh, we're going to be having um, a, sh a show that we're currently creating in-house about black holes. Uh, and that's going to lead out the season at the end of the year. We have uh, shows that are uh, tying into what you're doing here at Lowell Observatory that uh, we're um, pleased and honored to be able to bring uh, your stream of the annular solar eclipse to the planetarium um, on October 14th, uh, because it seems like like you have a lot planned to bring to the world for that event. Yeah, and that this is one of the points is making it available to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we collaborate like this, um, that many more people are able to see it. Oh, yeah. How many, do you have a typical number of visitors, you know, from the public every night or oh, so does that really vary? Uh, it, we... We have a problem, which is a very good problem to have, but it is still a problem that we don't have the space for the enthusiasm that we get. So there are actually a lot of weekends where we do sell out. Um, and our planetarium, it certainly cannot handle the capacity that Lowell Observatory does. Um, but uh, we have 116 seats. And so we'll have, you know, five or six shows on a weekend. So we'll have, you know, a few hundred people that will come through on a weekend. Uh, and we have, you know, over a thousand people on average that will come through on a month. So very much um, less people than you're seeing, but uh, we're certainly uh, serving a lot of our local public and we do our best to try and do And do you, do you get a lot of bottle towners? Or is uh, it mostly locals or? So that is actually an interesting paradigm. The, the previous planetarium I worked at was in the middle of Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And so 
you will have new people going through every yeah. single day. And uh, so their strategy with, with shows and content was that they didn't um, have to have new things every day. That they could have a show that could play for a season and you would still fill the seats mm -hmm. because uh, there would be fresh eyes all the time. Uh, and to your point, there was there's very much more of a local regular that comes in yeah. Prescott, Arizona. There are certainly tourists that come by, uh, but a lot of who we serve are people that come through and then they're like, hey, what's going to happen next week? Or, hey, what's going to happen next month? Or, hey, can we get a membership so we can just like can yeah. come by every day? Uh, so that we have more of a... We're creating this sort of intimate, growing relationship with the people that are, are nearby to us and trying to figure out how we can bring more and more new content to them um, every day from every which way. So how, do, how does a visitor... Um Get tickets. You have online or walk up to the door, give uh, you a personal call. Yeah. So so please, uh, my, my, my home phone number right now. No. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a couple of different ways. And, and one is, uh, of course, online. And the easiest way, ignore memorizing the URL, just Google Prescott Planetarium or Jim and yeah. Linda Lee Planetarium. We're the first thing that shows up. And yeah, people can get tickets to upcoming public programming, including the Lowell live stream. Um, and also uh, we have a box office. Uh, the, the one tragedy of the box office is because of our popularity right now, there will be people that will show up. They drew, d drove from Flagstaff and there's no more seats. So yeah. it's, it's, it's recommended to get your uh, tickets online. Uh, that way, you know for sure that you have a place to sit. That would be my recommendation. So you, so you have this great problem of sometimes not having enough space. Yeah. Um, do you have any alternate plans down the road of, you know, we're getting these crowds. How do we accommodate more? Uh, so I mean, you can only fit so many people inside of a planetarium at once. You you can and so you know we could add a second floor trapeze artist we can we can like yeah. get there <laughs> but uh, uh, one of my big dreams we'll see if we get there is is to um, expand um, the planetarium in terms of its personnel so um, as I you know I, I'd love to work seven days a week twenty four hours a day but yeah you can't yeah. do it uh, so if we have a, a, a bigger staff on there we can add more shows and uh, th that's something that I think is going to add. Magnificent value not only to the public but to Embry Riddle, and so uh, that's that's what I'm uh, talking to people about now, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. One of the things that when I look at Lowell Observatory, and I'm always just flabbergasted in a very good way by, mm -hmm. is how many people work here. That you seem like you have this intricate network of scientists, outreach professionals, um, uh, people that are all focused on this goal of Lowell to bring this awe to Flagstaff and beyond. And you have such a wonderful operation going. Like, I know it's a big question, but how'd you get here? Well, I'll, I'll point out one th obvious thing. You started in 2017. Yes. We started in 1894. Oh, I'm too impatient. So, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's with like, like many businesses yeah. and entities, it's gone through cycles. Yeah. Um, initially, our founder, Percival Lowell, said, we're going to do telescope viewing for the public. Um, there, we can find old newspapers that talk about Saturday nights coming up to mm. the observatory. Um, and it was informal. Mm -hmm. um, as the years went on, you know, we get visitors would come and go. The major thing was research. But then Pluto's discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tumbaugh here. And a lot more people are coming through. And so you have these these kind of punctuated equilibrium, as, as Stephen Jay Gould would have said mm. in paleontology. Everything's going along, and then you have something big happening, and it creates the surge. And so we we had a visitor program that's kind of evolved over time. And so we had a core of scientists and support staff, mm -hmm. um, groundskeepers, business office, um, so on. Um, and that was that was the majority of the observatory for a long time. Yeah. Those doing education were the astronomers. Okay, who who drew the straw today? Uh um, in the 19, I guess the 1970s, 80s, that kind of expanded into more of a formal thing okay. um, with uh, somebody dedicated to running the program and some dedicated staff. And then in the late 80s, um, our Lowell has a unique structure. There's a sole trustee that's a member of our founder's family. Mm -hmm. And he decided to really expand the public program. Um, and that meant building a dedicated visitor center, not a room in a building. Mm -hmm. Um, that, okay, let's use it for this now, not the old library. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that opened in um, 1994, the centennial of the observatory. Uh -huh. And and since then, the program has continued to grow. And so we have 
you know, scientists, educators, plus all of our sports staff, well over 150 staff now. So it's something that happened over time. Yeah. Um, our initial focus, while, while there's interest in doing public education, the initial focus was certainly research. And that's what, what I would say drives us mm -hmm. um, today. But, but it's become more of that, you know, communicating science, whether it's our scientists writing papers and giving scientific presentations or our educators welcoming guests and showing them telescope views. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that, that certainly has taken time. Um, I, you know, with you, you're mm -hmm. starting, education is foremost what you're doing with the planetarium. So you're gonna develop things a lot faster, I think. I, and I don't know what your footprint is, how much how much you can expand, like you have the planetarium, but can you develop another area for doing stargazing mm -hmm. and um, telescope viewing? I know there's this Prescott Astronomy Club mm -hmm. that's been going for a long time and mm -hmm. just a great group of people. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to have them come in and, and do some, you know, star parties while people are waiting for the program, you know, they have something else to do. Oh, and yeah. Those are all things that depending on how much space you have. And of course, staffing is always <laughs> challenging because if it's volunteer staff, it can be, there's more of a volunteer base in Prescott, I think, than Flagstaff because this is a higher proportion of retired folks, mm -hmm. um, which tend to be a lot of volunteers. But, but that, you know, how do you support having more staff? Mm -hmm. If it's volunteers or if it's paid staff, where's the money coming from? Oh, yes, that's there's always a, the question. Those are always... Yeah. things that you have to build into. Mm -hmm. But I like where you guys are with doing these programs and um, the good problem to have, you have more people than you have space for right yeah. now. And hey, uh, when it comes to more people than you have space for, I appreciate the pun. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. We're full of them here. <laughs> <laughs> um, it just, uh, I, I think with with Lowell, even when, with its grand history with uh, the Jim and Linda Lee Planetarium, there's there's such potential moving forward and there's such momentum that's coming to play. So I can say on behalf of, of Embry-Riddle of the Planetarium that we appreciate the connections you make with us and other institutions like us. It's uh, It seems like even with the amazingly largely growing amount of visitors that you have, um, that the spread of Lowell is not just there, that, the, that it is in some of the connections that it's forging with other um, institutions. Sure. So. And, and I don't know specifically like the travel patterns um, tourism in Prescott, but I know mm -hmm. tourism is a big thing for all our mm -hmm. state, our entire state. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot of people coming through. And quite often, um, what do they have to do at night? Um, that's that's kind of a, a niche that hasn't been completely filled. I mean, here in Flagstaff at Lowell, we've got the observatory. Um, I mean, there are other things to do. But, you know, the museums and outdoor experiences are more during the daytime. Mm -hmm. Having a planetarium, you know, where you do that at night, it, it gives those people something, you know, something to do. And then the locals, you know, you have family in, of course, you want to take them something unique. And going to a planetarium is is not a common thing. Mm. I mean, there are planetaria around the country, but it's not something everybody sees. Oh, and it just seems like northern Arizona as a region is poised to become such a a place of celebration of astronomy. Right. That, Astrotourism is really growing. Yeah. Uh, that there's ways that uh, I think so many people can come here, see the Grand Canyon, see Flagstaff and Lowell Observatory, see the Planetarium in Prescott, um, that the stars are aligning, if you'll excuse me, yeah. um, for this to be a region where people come to see the stars. And, it's, and it makes sense. Uh, you know, we've got the first dark sky city in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of dark sky communities around Northern Arizona. Grand Canyon is a dark sky park. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, you know, I think as we go on in time, we're so in tune to staring at our phones. You know, I've certainly seen this talking to a lot of visitors where they, you know, you want to break from that. You want to get back to just, you know, being human and looking around, whether it's going for a walk in the woods, mm. looking up in the sky and, and because Arizona is such a dark sky um, place, not, not I mean, you know, certainly Phoenix and big cities, mm -hmm. it's, that it's not necessarily dark. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more people and lighting mm -hmm. there, but still there's so many places around the state and people looking for that opportunity to reconnect with nature and the universe. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity. Yeah. Um, something 
unique to do at nighttime. Oh, yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of different opportunities. Do you remember the first time you looked through a telescope and saw a planet? It was here at Lowell. Yeah. Girl, I never looked through a telescope until I got here. And what planet was it? It was Jupiter. It was Jupiter. Yeah, and it was oh, it was so cool. And it was through <laughs> it was through the big twenty four inch refractor. Oh, there and so we just go. just being in that building was I'm looking around and look at all the history and you know, I look around at something like that and think the heritage, like this was built in eighteen ninety six. Yeah. How many generations of people spent their entire careers right where I'm standing? Mm -hmm. And Percival Lowell, who popularized so much in astronomy, this idea of life in the universe, was standing right where I am. Um, and that, that's before I got to the telescope. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's spectacular. How about you? Oh, for me, yeah, I honestly don't remember the first time I, yeah. I, I looked through a telescope. Um, I do remember the first time I looked through a telescope and it mattered to me. Um, where uh, part of it was that all of a sudden I was doing research in astronomy and I was starting to understand the context. And all of a sudden I was looking through um, this refracting telescope and I was moving it myself and I found Mars. And it was just uh, this sort of experience of, oh, hey, I not only can I see the universe, but I have some contextual relationship to mm -hmm. it. And that's one of the things I always... I always like to keep in mind when we bring kids into the planetarium is, oh, okay, this, the universe is amazing. Let's, let's see the stars. Let's see the planets. Let's see this black hole here. And also, let's talk about you in relation to the universe. What can you do? How can you be a part of this? So it's not just this amazing uh, tableau that you're staring at. You're a part of it and trying to bring that connection in at every point. And that's, that's exactly our angle here. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, when we market a little observatory, we're not marketing us, we're marketing our potential mm -hmm. guests and wanting to show them why this is such a unique thing. Yeah. And that's what we're all trying to do is inspire oh, yeah. the, the awe and wonder of it all. Yeah. So it's really great having you here today where this time goes so fast. <laughs> it does. <laughs> um, but, but it's great talking about this. Yeah. I know we'll be talking more in the, down the road. In fact, I'll be seeing you on October 14th, at least virtually. Oh, yes. I'll be, I'll be hosting that program. Oh, fantastic. So it'll be fun to do that. Yeah. And we're looking forward to a lot more partnerships with you guys. And, and I encourage all of our, our listeners, watchers, I guess, um, to check out um, the planetarium at Embry-Riddle. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe check that out. Come up to Lowell Observatory. Do both. Yeah. Um, great. Make it a great dark sky uh -huh. weekend. That, yeah, uh, the Northern Arizona astronomy, it's all yes. coming together. Yep. So thank you so much for having me on and also for this growing partnership. I think there's a lot to look forward to coming right along the horizon. Well, Eric Edelman of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Again, I'm Kevin Schindler, historian and public information officer here at Lowell. And thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Star Stuff. This podcast was made possible by our members and donors. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support our nonprofit in making more digital education like this available, go to lowell.edu slash donate. Thanks for listening.